if you want to know how it's possible to have right standing with God, which means to be able to stand in God's presence without any fear or shame, without any sense that you are causing offense or have caused offense before him, if you want to stand before God free and clear in righteousness, you're going to want to listen carefully this morning to this message. Uh, we're in the book of Romans, written by the Apostle Paul, and what I encourage you to do is to turn to chapter 4 in Romans and go through verses 13 to 25. That's what we're talking about today. One of the things Paul is trying to make abundantly clear here in Romans chapter 4 is that law-keeping, a strict following of the laws and legal requirements of Judaism as laid down in the Mosaic laws, will never cause God to unleash his blessings and will never cause him to declare even the most diligent follower of the rules righteous. In Jesus' day, we know that the Pharisees were the law teachers. They were also ones that were trying to prove that they were righteous before God because they obeyed all these strict rules and they taught other people to obey these strict laws and requirements. Even the Apostle Paul, as a young rabbi, was one who was pursuing this false path of attempting to manufacture his own righteousness before God. Now today in the church, we also run into this temptation. What we do is we sometimes fall into the ditch of legalism. And of course, we're not trying to keep all the Jewish rituals and festivals and make all the temple sacrifices but we fall into the temptation that we must prove ourselves to be good, to be good enough to please God, to be good enough to be able to stand in his presence. And what better way to be sure that you're good enough than to have some very strict rules to obey, and then you can measure yourself against how well you do with those rules. Have you ever known someone in your family or amongst your friends or even people you've known at church who seem to be seeking God, they may even go to church on a regular basis, but they hesitate to take that step of faith to either uh, make a profession of faith or to get baptized or to join the church as a member. Somewhere inside them is this deep-seated concern that they need to get cleaned up first, that they're not yet good enough to join the family of God. And one popular way to deal with that problem is that people come up with strict moral rules to obey, and then they have a gauge against which they can judge how they're doing. If they follow them rigorously, then they can feel justified before God. They can feel like they are a righteous person of whom God would approve. So they develop these rules, and some of us still do this today. Some of us fall into this ditch from time to time. We feel like we need to make ourselves acceptable before God. Maybe we quit smoking or give up alcohol or never gamble, or quit cussing, or wear modest clothing, or just in general avoid anything immodest, including dancing. Or we avoid watching anything that's risque or racy. So that means our television watching is limited to watching Andy Griffith shows and a, a televangelists. The list of must-dos and do-nots goes on and on and on. Now, it's not that these practices are bad in and of themselves. Some of these might actually be healthy choices for a Christian. 
They might be occasions for joyful obedience to God or um, ways in which you can fast voluntarily and sacrifice voluntarily in your walk with the Lord. You might want to do these things out of reverence and out of gratitude to God and to focus yourself more on the things of God because you've looked into God's holy word and you've seen that these are some of the right ways of living for the children of God. The problem is when the motivation behind this slavish devotion to these rules is a belief that you can move the hand of God to approve of you, that you can force God to categorize you as one of the good ones, that by your adherence to the rules, you cause God to unleash his blessings on you. And this is one thing Paul is trying to make absolutely clear to the Christians in Rome, that law-keeping in and of itself is of no benefit in your relationship with the Lord. That a Christian who desires to experience the presence of God without shame or a sense of inferiority or a sense of condemnation gains nothing by rigorously following the law, following the rules. The only thing necessary for right standing with God is faith. Faith that God will fulfill his promises. Faith that those promises are fulfilled through Jesus Christ. So Paul uses the example of Abraham. And when he looks at the story of Abraham and, and the time period in which Abraham lived, he makes this point that if we consider Abraham to be righteous, which the Jewish people did, they considered him to be the, their father in the faith and also the father of the nation of Israel, they considered him to be righteous, but how could he be righteous if he lived in a time before the laws of Moses were given to the people, the laws of God were given through Moses to the people? In other words, Abraham had no law. So how is it possible that Abraham could be righteous by the law? And another fact that we need to recognize is that in Israel, in the history of Israel, there is never an instance where anyone has adequately kept the law anyway. So if the law is the means by which the Jewish people are hoping to be made righteous before God, it's never going to work. The obeying of the law must not actually be the means by which people acquire righteousness from God. Abraham all he did was he believed God when God spoke to him and made promises to him. He believed those promises and trusted in God's character and his ability to fulfill those promises. And so, by his faith in God, it was credited to him as righteousness. God gave him a credit. Now, this is the language of the marketplace that you have debits and credits and you usually get credits if you've earned a salary let's say you get credits you get it in the credit column and if you purchase something it goes in the debit column but Abraham's experience shows us there's nothing we can do to earn the fulfillment of God's promises even our faith doesn't earn us any credits but instead God in his grace chooses to issue us a credit or issue Abraham a credit because it's only up to God to do that. There's no way to earn that credit. Even if we thought of ourselves as some sort of employee trying to earn a paycheck from God, we can never work hard enough or enough hours or succeed enough in the assignments he gives us to earn right standing with him. If we think of our arrangement with God as some sort of bar barter, you know, I'll do this for you if you do this for me, we can never outgive God, we can never outwork God. So there's no circumstance under which he could owe us. We never get back a credit 
or change from God because our financial giving was so big or our service was larger than what was called for. The only option for the fulfillment of God's promises to us is that he gives it to us as a free gift. Now, I think it's important to recognize the reason Paul brings up Abraham is because our Christian faith is based on what God has done in human history with real human beings, real flesh and blood people, the experiences they had with God and what they learned from those experiences and then what was recorded in their testimony down through the generations. So praise the Lord, our religion, our faith is based on real people in history interacting with the same God that, God, that Abraham inter, interacted with, the same God acting in history. We don't deal in myths or legends or contrived religious ideas. We look at someone like Abraham as an illustration to learn from because his lessons are still relevant to us today. We're dealing with the same God that Abraham experienced way back when. And Abraham serves as a wonderful illustration of what faith is. It's not that we emulate Abraham as a model. He is not our model to live by. That, that person is Jesus. But Abraham is an illustration that helps us to understand what faith is and how faith functions. So here's one of the main points I want you to understand about faith. Faith is not what a lot of people think of as, as uh, optimism or faith in oneself, one, belief in oneself that you can achieve something. I mean, that's a different word entirely. That's a different meaning for faith. Faith, according to God's word, is that you have faith in something that is a valid object for your faith. You must have a valid object for your faith. And in this case, the valid object is God's promises. So to have faith, you must have faith in a valid object, which is God's promises to us. Out of his abundant grace, God makes promises to give us something that only he has the power to give, and he gives it not because we earn it or deserve it. It's actually completely undeserved. That's the definition of grace. He says, by his own volition, he says, I will do this for you. And we find all kinds of promises from God in his holy word. That's why people usually begin their faith walk with scripture. They turn to the scriptures, they read the promises of God, and they believe and trust in God to fulfill those promises. So in Abraham's case, the promise God made to him was that he would have an heir, a male heir, and that that male heir would then lead to Abraham being the father of many nations. And this would have seemed absolutely impossible to Abraham he was old as dirt, and his wife was old as dirt. They were so old, they were basically walking dead. There was no chance in human terms for them ever to conceive a child. It was about as unlikely as God telling me this afternoon, Keith, you're going to be an NFL quarterback. I mean, come on, I'm 54 years old, I'm klutzy, and... I've never been on a football team except for one afternoon <laughs> and when I was 10 years old, neighborhood touch football, something like that. So it's at least as absurd as God saying to Abraham, you and Sarah will have a son. Yet when, Abra when God made the promise, Abraham accepted God's word and he had faith in the promise. He trusted God and lived for years in the hope that this miracle would happen. So what's the promise God makes to us? He promises us, all of us, that he will set us right. He promises to place on us righteousness, which 
can be defined as right standing with God. So what Paul calls God's righteousness is the righteousness that God requires of humanity in order for them to be approved and to stand in his presence without shame, without condemnation. And it's a gift God gives to the person of faith. So we believe that God will fulfill this promise because we trust in the God who makes the promise. We trust that he will keep his promise and that he's got the power to fulfill this promise, no matter how unlikely it seems to us. And of course, this idea that we would be made right before God is something that does seem unlikely to many of us. And there's a reason for that. It's because of how this fallen world functions in terms of relationships. We have learned this lesson. It's been ingrained in us that in order to be approved of by other people, in order to uh, gain stature in society, you need to do something in order to deserve that. In other words, you have to earn the approval of other people. But that's not how faith works. That's what Paul wants us to know. That's not how faith works. Faith works with, first, God gives us an object for our faith, and that is his promise. And then second, we simply trust in the one who has made the promise. And why do we trust in the one who's made the promise? Well, because we have seen Jesus. <coughs> we have experienced Jesus. We have come to know him through the scriptures, through the testimony of those who have known him. We have heard his teaching. We have seen his actions and his miracles. And we believe. We have heard and we believe. Jesus showed us what the Father is like. By seeing and knowing the Son, we have seen and known the Father. We know that God fulfills his promises because Jesus has shown us, especially in the resurrection, Jesus has shown us that our God is one who does what he says he's going to do. So no one need ever feel like it's hopeless. We never need to feel like there's not a chance for us to stand right before God or to please God. We don't need to get cleaned up first or to do anything else to please God, although we may want to do certain things that are pleasing to God once we are made righteous. That's perfectly valid. But that's not the requirement in order to be made righteous in God's sight. The offer is the same for everyone. God says, trust in me when I make the promise that you will be made right, perfect and righteous in my sight. Believe on Jesus and believe that the same power that raised him from the dead also has the power to transform us, transform you. I want to finish up with just sharing with you a little testimony from Ray Stedman who is a, a well-known pastor. When he was a child, he, his experiences gave him every reason to doubt others and to lack faith that he would ever um, be able to trust in anyone, basically. Um, when he was a child, his father abandoned the family and his mother was left alone, a you know, single parent with three boys but she suffered from asthma and it was incredibly hard for her to manage disciplining three young boys. So in desperation, she gave up Ray for adoption, brought him to an orphanage. So he was placed, thankfully, with a kind and stable couple who turned out to be Methodists. And in that new place, in that new home, he learned the promises of God. And this is what Ray Stedman says about hearing those promises. He says, this is the way I came to Christ. I read the Bible and heard quoted from the Bible some wonderful promises. As I heard these, hope flamed in my heart because this is what I long to find. Rest, fulfillment, supply, companionship, blessing, light, in places of darkness, 
And then I heard the story of the cross and all its wonder and mystery. I couldn't understand it fully. I was only a boy of about 10 years of age when I heard this story and believed it. But I realized that there was a God who could do something about my problem, and I believed his word. When I did so, the course of my life was altered. The direction of my life changed. I found a new capacity for love. I had a new dimension in my life, new attitudes I didn't have before. See, this is the power of faith, believing in the promises you have heard, because our God is trustworthy. We know that it all comes down to trust that God will fulfill his promises to give us righteousness so that we will be, we will be suitable to live in his presence forever. So I just urge you today, begin your walk of faith and trust by putting your hand in Jesus' hand and setting your eyes on the cross.